Okay. Um, I think. Yeah, it started. At least it says it started. Okay, we're we're welcome back. Uh, hopefully, you guys have got acquainted and nourished, and now you're awake for at least another half hour. Um, so we're getting into. Uh, we've done metabolite annotation or compound identification uh, using NMR. And we're going to go to the second phase, we'll call it Metabolite Identification and Annotation Part 2. So this is all about trying to generate lists. So we, we worked with the Konomic software, you guys might use a little bit more as part of the assignment, uh, but I wanted to tell you a little more of other tools that are available, it's not the only one. Um, and then we're going to move into other fields, so there's GCMS, so you can do deconvolution with that, and you can do... Um, deconvolution with LCMS. So we'll, we'll learn about that. And each of these methods, all we're interested in doing, as I said, is to go from spectra to lists. And that's an important thing. Um, I'll also sort of close off on, on how we can do compound identification with uh, high resolution mass spec formula generation and also a little bit on unknown compound identification. So here's that goal, this is the central focus of today really, to go from spectra or multiple spectra to lists, lists of metabolites, preferably with the concentrations, but potentially also relative concentrations. So we saw how this was done with NMR, you guys were doing deconvolution. And uh, some people are wondering, you know, why are we doing this phasing, why are we doing this uh, baseline correction? And, I guess the analogy I was giving was, imagine if we took a photo like we did today, but in fact uh, it was of each of us individually. And imagine that the camera was really out of focus and furthermore the development process or whatever we did just made a very distorted image. And so we printed off one of those photos and we said, who is this a picture of? And if it's really out of focus and really badly distorted, most of us probably couldn't figure out who it is even if it's just the 23, 24 people in this room. So if the photo is in high focus and not distorted, then it's much easier to identify who it is. Our, our facial recognition uh, in our brain um, is, is more effective. What you were doing with the, the, the process of baseline correcting, phasing, all of that stuff was to try and make the spectra uh, less distorted put it into focus so that you could compare it to a reference uh, photo uh, of a very pure compound that had been perfectly uh, uh, phased and perfectly corrected. These are perfectly phased and perfectly f uh, baseline corrected spectra, and that's, that's what our reference spectra are. And we can only do that deconvolution if the mixture spectrum is also perfectly phased and perfectly baseline corrected. So that's what you were doing. Um, now, in terms of Konomics, I think some of you appreciate that it's fairly manually intensive. It's a fair bit of work. Um, so there's other types of tools. Uh, there's Amix, which is produced by Brooker. Um, there's other tools that are somewhat automated. Uh, AutoFit is one, Batman is another one. So this was published uh, two years ago. This was just recently published. There's software specific for 2D NMR, and this is something that Jeff, your TA, wrote. Um, there's databases that support spectral matching. There's tools um, in Japan, and then there's downloadable software uh, also for um, uh, spectral matching. And I'll go through some of them. So as I said, you saw how tedious or a manual it is when you're doing this. Um, so it would be nice if you could do this automatically. Uh, the software is, is starting to come out. Um, this one was developed, um, but the, the, the code has not been released, unfortunately. Um, but it, it, it uses um, a compound library, it has a spectrum. Um, it uh, identifies uh, the DSSP, it calibrates things. Um, and then it looks at a various collection of those peak clusters, just like you guys were doing, except it does that automatically. And then it, it uh, has a, a nonlinear optimizer that uh, helps determine what fits best and handles the noise. 
So this is an example of, I don't know if, so the black line is the actual spectrum, the red line is the calculated spectrum. This is one where someone did manual fitting, and it takes anywhere from half an hour to an hour to sort of do all of the fitting. And, and you can see it fits pretty well. There's some things sort of in the, in the low noise area where it's not so great, but in these cases, the compounds hadn't been formally identified. Here's the automatic fit, uh, so with the auto fit, and there's not much difference, um, except this is a lot faster. So part of it is you have to appreciate how hard it is to do it manually, and then now you can appreciate how nice it is to have things automatic. So automation speeds it up, obviously. Uh, measures on precision and recall are very, very high. Um, if you can go to a computer system, then it, it doesn't vary with individuals. And different individuals perform differently. And we could do a test today, and you know, we might say, OK, we want everyone to complete their analysis. What do you end up with? And the odds are, with 25 people here, we'll end up with 25 different answers. The answers will differ perhaps just in their concentrations and maybe not in the identification, but there'll probably be at least half of you who will identify some compounds that others wouldn't have identified. So by moving it to a computer-based system, you get something that is reproducible. So even if the computer is wrong, it's still re reproducibly wrong. And that's important uh, when you do uh, anything in statistics. Um, and it avoids some of the user bias, which can persist and develop over time. It also is able to pick up and deconvolute some things that people consistently get confused with. Um, so that's another advantage of auto automation. So you can take real spectra uh, from CSF and urine. Or these are s sort of simulated spectra, so you put a composition in, uh, create what you think is urine, create what you think is cerebral spinal fluid, change the concentrations, change some of the compounds that are in there, and then you run it through this auto fit. And um, in this synthetic urine and, and synthetic CSF, the fit is perfect. When you use real CSF, real urine, real serum, um, fit's no longer perfect, and part of that has to do with the fact that humans are imperfect. So we're comparing to what a human has determined compared to what a computer has determined. And we can't tell who's necessarily correct. Is the computer correct? Is the human correct? Who's wrong? So the correlations still are very, very high, 0 0.98, 0 0.99. Um, but there are some misidentifications, and that's still an issue. The concentrations are also very highly correlated. Uh, again, looks like you know, human experts match pretty well with what the uh, spectra are able to do. As I said, the, the software was published a, two years ago now, but unfortunately the uh, code base has not been released. It actually belongs with Konomics. <laughs> so maybe one day they'll make that commercial. Um, there are freeware packages. Um, so dealing with mixtures, uh, Jeff uh, developed this software tool to allow people to look at two-dimensional NMR. Some of you may not have heard about two-dimensional NMR, but this is a standard way of collecting um, spectra. And, and instead of one-dimensional NMR, which is what you were looking at, you see peaks um, not in a spectrum, but in a, in a plane. And you see sort of looking at them overhead the way you'd look at a topographic map. So this is a, a toxic spectrum of, I think, I don't know, urine. Um, and it has a variety of, of tools for both displaying, visualizing, and, and marking off metabolites. But it has a large library of uh, both toxi spectra, about 225, large library of, of HSQC, carbon-13. And then what the key thing for this, and the key thing as well for that autofit, is, is that having that prior knowledge, which is uh, what is the fluid you're looking at, and what's the likely composition of that fluid. And so this gives you what we call a biological constraint as well as a, as a mathematical constraint. So when you have both constraints, the problem is largely solvable. So the method um, that Metabolite Miner allows you to do automatic processing, it also allows you to do some semi-automatic 
compound identification. It looks for things called minimal signature peaks. Um, and um, people can do direct annotation. So it's been tested on a bunch of uh, you know, sort of artificial or synthetic cocktails, um, compounds that are identifiable given the, the accuracy or sensitivity of the instrument, uh, the number of compounds that identified, the percent that were correct, both for TOXI, for HSQC. Um, this is for a synthetic cocktail. This is for uh, blood plasma or serum. And then this is measures of what we call recall uh, precision. So this is a statistical measure of the performance. So it's, it's not perfect, and it is somewhat pH dependent. And this has to do with the fact that the reference spectra weren't collected at every pH. They were all typically collected around pH 7. So if you start analyzing a sample that's very acidic or very basic, the method won't work too well. Um, but overall, um, the performance is, is actually quite good. And given that the software is free, that's a pretty good, pretty good deal. So there are other approaches. Um, you can use uh, databases, uh, which are publicly available. One database is called HMDB, uh, the Human Metabolism <coughs> Database. And in this case, uh, if you have chemical shifts that you've identified, and you can do this with any standard software, and you just produce a list of chemical shifts, you feed in that list of shifts into the query tool in HMDB, uh, just type in the numbers, and it will identify um, likely candidates in terms of the compounds that may be there. Software called Prime, which is uh, produced by Rikin in, in Japan, a sort of similar approach, but has a much smaller database. But again, you can paste in a bunch of chemical shifts, press, sub, press submit, and it will give you a list of, of possible um, matches. So this isn't fitting. It's not going to give you quantitation, and it'll give you possible alternatives. So it's not, neither the HMDB approach nor the Prime are intended to do what, say, the Konomics or AutoFit do. The other thing, I guess, um, Tabominer identifies, but it does not quantify. So that's a different issue. So doing two-dimensional NMR allows you to reduce some of the spectral redundancy, uh, but it's, it's, it's very hard to quantify with two-dimensional NMR. And, and this has to do with spin relaxation issues and, and collecting 2D spectra. A package that you can download uh, called RNMR, this is, it's written in R, um, but it does have a nice uh, user interface um, for both processing and annotating spectra. So this sort of does a, a little bit what, like what uh, Metabo Miner does, um, but it is, rather than being Well, it's, it's recently modified itself, so it actually uses most of the algorithms, apparently, <laughs> that Metabo Miner has uh, to help with uh, compound identification. Uh, the Biomag ResBank, uh, which is also maintained in Madison, um, Wisconsin, uh, has a large collection of NMR spectra, about the same size that HMDB has. And it also has uh, capacity where you can type in peaks and search for proton or carbon or HSQC uh, peaks, and it'll see if it will, can match something in its database, which can give you a suggestion of what the compound might be. Uh, the last one uh, that I'd mentioned was Batman, and this is um, uh, something that was developed at Imperial College uh, by Tim Ebbles and colleagues, and it, it uses a, a what's called a Bayesian, which is where the BA comes from, method. So Bayesian statistics is sort of allows you to incorporate prior knowledge. Um, it also allows you uh, to um, do uh, some exclusive or type operations if you want. Um, and they've used this program to help perform automatic fitting of, of, of NMR spectra, sort of like the auto fit program that I talked about before. It doesn't do quantitation, um, 
and it has a fairly limited size in terms of it can fit maybe about 20 or 25 compounds. Um, but it's, it's, it's appealing and, and uh, they continue to work a lot on it um, because I think this is where people would like to go. They'd like to make these systems automated. So that's sort of filling in, I guess, the, the holes about the NMR. Uh, as I say, you don't have to use Konomic software, but it hopefully it puts it into a context where you say that there's some of them are for quantitation, some are for identification, some are for 1D, some are for 2D, some are for carbon, some are for proton, um, some are free, some aren't. I'm going to switch now to metabolite identification by GCMS. And this is the general concept here, which is in gas chromatography mass spec, we have a chromatogram with peaks. And we've seen a bunch of those before. And what we do is we typically will then analyze a peak. Now, in chromatography, I mentioned before, separation is imperfect. And often under a single peak, there may be three other compounds or four other compounds that have essentially the same migration time. But, so there's the red peak, the blue peak, the turquoise peak. Um, each of those are separate compounds, but they produce a single peak. They also have separate mass spec. And these are electron ionization mass spec, pretend. Um, but each of these mass spec tells us there are three compounds. The integrated area under these tells us the relative concentration, if you want. What are these compounds? So this is where we do spectral deconvolution again. And what we do is we look to see if this spectrum matches anything in this database. So the idea is to create a large database of EI mass spectra, just like we were dealing with a large database of, of proton uh, NMR spectra. And so you can look at this spectrum and you can just sort of do a scan to see which one looks most similar and this one looks the most similar. So if we know the compound that generated this, then we've identified this compound. And then because we know the peak area, uh, we can estimate the relative or absolute concentration. Same thing with this one. We can look through this database of seven or eight compounds and see, is there anything that matches? Yes, this does. So now we've got another compound identified. So that is spectral deconvolution, except for mass spec. A little different conceptually, but similar overall. So in the case of electron ionization, uh, we saw this before. This is methanol. And we saw that it typically it's characterized by multiple peaks because it's fragmented into multiple small fragments. Um, so here's a more realistic one uh, with multiple peaks. Uh, here is the molecular ion, uh, the parent ion. Sometimes you'll see an ion that's sort of larger because maybe there's a, a chloride adduct attached to it, but not often. So this is the parent ion, these are the fragments. That's a GCMS, and that's, uh, that's a mass spectrum from electron ionization. And we can use that to run that up, up against a database. Now, in the case of GCMS, the important thing to remember is that these are typically not pure compounds. They are derivatized compounds. Now, for volatiles, uh, aromatic compounds that make things smell, those don't have to be derivatized. You can feed those directly into the GCMS, and so they aren't necessarily derivatized. But most metabolites that we look at from tissues and biofluid samples are not volatile, so we derivatize them with TMS. And TMS will react with hydroxyl and amine groups. There are other variations of TB TMS, so TBDMS. There's also methoxines, which will also react with certain compounds like ketones. So each of these things can react. Sometimes you can have one, two, or three additions, or four or five, and these will add certain masses to that. Um, so these are the metabolite plus TMS, the metabolite plus methoxine. So in the case of GCMS, as I mentioned before, it's typically used to look at more soluble, water-soluble compounds, amino acids, organic acids, sugars, which LCMS doesn't do a very good job with um, fatty acids. It's also limited to looking at relatively lower molecular weight compounds, 500, 600 Daltons. So it misses the lipids, which are typically very big. Um, 
The gas chromatography we'd mentioned before, very reproducible, higher plate count, um, higher resolution, so it's a good form of chromatography. The mass spec that we use in gas chromatography is also more consistent, uh, more universally applicable, more standardized than the most of the soft ionization methods. So the databases you use in GCMS are actually more useful. And typically when we want to identify compounds, identifying the, the known unknowns, uh, we use, most people use this combination of the AMDIS software and the National Institutes of Standards uh, database, the NIST database. So the NIST database, uh, it's version 11 now, has a lot of spectra, <coughs> a quarter million spectra. So that's a lot more than the 450 <coughs> in Konomics or the 225 in Metabominer. And it's corresponding to 212,000 compounds. It also has uh, MS data um, for ion traps and QTOFs and triple, triple clods for about 3,700 compounds and for 4,600 compounds. Additionally, it also has retention index values for a lot of compounds, about 20,000. So this is the single largest resource of spectral data uh, available. Unfortunately, most of the compounds are not metabolites and probably will never be seen in any living system. So that's a little um, frustrating. Um, so as large as it is, uh, it's not quite as useful as it might first seem or at first blush. Okay. So yes? How much, how is the populated? It's been populated over decades, so the co data collection that they do at the National Institute for Standards. They get uh, samples sent to them. A lot of them are, as I say, non-biological. Um, some of them are, a lot of them are toxins and poisons and pollutants and things like that. Um, some of them are um, food additives. Uh, but a lot of the, the compounds are really things that I never see outside the lab. Um, and the ones that are, are as I say, are very low abundance um, poisons, which are often below the detection limit for GCMS. Um, so, you know, it's, um, when I was, in the early days, everyone just sort of flocked to the NIST database thinking they would get all kinds of hits, but uh, they don't. They don't get that many hits, or as many as they'd hope. Um, there is a tool for, for searching. Um, they have structures for all of these. They have mass spec data. Um, um, so this is, some of the, the mass spectral searching tools that, that um, are part of the NIST database. Um, the other thing that you have to couple uh, the database with is this software called AMDIS, and that stands for Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution and Identification System. Um, so AMDIS does a lot of the things that you guys were doing with the NMR. Uh, it, it, tries to identify or deal with the noise, uh, identifies the peaks. Uh, it also tries to do the deconvolution. It also does the compound identification. Uh, and it's sort of semi-automatic, sort of again like what the Konomix software was. So as I said, the idea with the, the exercise you guys did was to just sort of say, okay, this is one approach, but really it's, it's very similar regardless of, of the, the type of spectroscopy you do. They're all challenged with trying to identify compounds, trying to clean things up, trying to reduce noise, trying to stabilize the um, uh, background or baseline, and then trying to deconvolute. So uh, with the Konomic software you guys used, you were trying to look to see what the subtracted line was and whether the green line zeroed out. Uh, that was kind of your visual match factor. There's a computational match factor that AMDIS does. And it's essentially a, uh, a normalized dot product. And the, the way they do is they treat the masses, their positions, as, as a vector of masses. And their intensities is another vector component. And so you dot the observed mass with the predicted mass spectrum. So there's multiple values. 
and then you normalize it based on the size of the reference and of the query. And then they scale it by 1,000. So perfect match factor would be uh, 1,000. Generally, if you get a match factor of more than about 700, that's considered good enough. The compound is real. But there are different cutoffs, and different labs will use different cutoffs. Um, So how do you do GCMS uh, identification? Uh, so I sort of highlighted this before. The first thing to do is prepare a set of standards. You need to have your, your reference standards, those alkanes, seven, eight, or nine, that span uh, a range of elution times, a range of sizes. And so that's your calibration standard. Um, also, before you start doing a GCMS run, you should always run a blank just to make sure that what's coming off the column isn't going to throw you off. Usually stuff does, because there's always stuff that sticks. Um, so that identifies um, sort of your background noise. And then using the same conditions that you ran your blank, you run your sample. So here's your external alkane sample. You can see some contaminants that may be part of the alkane mixture or stuff that comes off with the column as it ages. But you can see each of these compounds, beginning from octane to uh, is it hexadecane, um, coming off at range about 2 minutes to about 10 or 12 minutes in this particular run for this particular column. But this allows you then to convert all of your um, retention times to retention indices, RT to RR. So once you've got your calibration file, a CAL file, a CAL file, this is what's going to be used when you run the AMDA software. So you analyze your subsequent data using that calibration file uh, so that you can calculate the retention indices. And then once you've done that, then you can start searching through the NIST database to match uh, using those match factors to see what matches both in terms of uh, match factor value, but also sometimes in terms of, of um, retention index. Um, usually you also want to make sure you're not picking up any blanks or noise, and so you also make sure that any, any of the peaks that you've identified are not also found against in the blank. So here's your calibration file. Here was your set of eight or ten standards. Uh, you convert it to a CAL file, and once it's called a CAL file, then you can upload it into to AMDIS so that it now uh, adjusts your actual GCMS spectrum, let's say this is of urine, um, so that everything is produced to the correct, if you want, retention index. So uh, at this stage, you can start looking at individual peaks and seeing what's in the mass spectrum under each of those peaks. So this is when you start the database search. So I'm not sure if it's that visible. Um, but we, in red, we've highlighted a peak, and that peak is marked in white. Under that peak, there are three other peaks, a red peak, a yellow peak, and a blue peak. And um, those are marked as well with their um, parent ion values. Uh, one at 172, one at um, 73, and then I can't make out what the yellow one is. Um, but this is an example, as I say, where in GCMS, often there's a single peak that you think is there, but it's not a single compound. It's potentially several peaks. Um, and this is what actually the AMDA software has been able to sort of deconvolute by looking not only at the um, chromatogram, but also looking at the mass spectra that it's collected. So here we are zooming in a little further. It's the same peak that was barely visible here, so we've just zoomed in. We can see these, the white, the red, blue, the yellow sort of peaks. Um, and now we want to see if we can match um, for this peak or this particular spectrum um, the two most abundant uh, values. These, this is the, we'll call it the peak spectrum, 
And then we look through the reference spectrum, or in this case, you can do an automatic search using the dot product, and it's returning the highest match. So the match factor was 840, or 84%. And you can see that the spectrum looks essentially identical. And so in this case, we've been able to match this peak from this compound, or this set of compounds, to valine. So we don't have a lab with AMDIS in part because it costs money and to buy it for 22 people would break the bank. So um, the, um, there are other tools um, and um, AMDIS is not the only software nor is NIST database the only um, database. Um, recently, well, not that recently, people evaluated the performance of, of AMDIS and compared it to a tool called Analyzer Pro and Chromatoff. And interestingly, AMDIS didn't do the best. Uh, I can't remember, I think Analyzer Pro may have done the best. Um, likewise, um, people sometimes are frustrated with the NIST databases because they aren't compounds that we typically find in, in biological systems. So they've created a few other databases. Um, the GOLM database um, and the Oliver Fien, or the FinLab database, which is sold by Lico and Agilent. And then HMDB has, at different times in its life, had, had reference GCMS spectrum. So GOLM database is, is in Germany. Um, it's prepared by the Max Planck Institute. And they um, have focused specifically on plant metabolites. They've collected about 1,400 plant metabolites, but many plant metabolites are also mammalian and microbial. So it has some general use. They also um, not only provide the mass spec data for uh, typical quad and TOF GCMS, but they also uh, give the retention index um, um, for that. And the retention index is, is really, really important. Um, because they've collected on different platforms, different instrument configurations, they have about eight spectra for each metabolite. The, Libraries they have are actually compatible with uh, AMDIS and NIST, so you can actually add them into the NIST system and analyze things by AMDIS. Um, and um, it also supports sort of web searches as well. So this is a screenshot of the, the database, so you can look at it, you can search through it, you can view uh, the mass spectra, you can get lists of peaks, and, information that they've collected. So it's very extensive, very well maintained. Uh, the Fiend Lab, Oliver Fiend's group, has collected lots of GCMS data for, for many, many samples. Um, they have about a thousand compounds that are below the standard mass spec cutoff for GCMS, cover lots of metabolites. Um, and they've done it for both quads and TOFs, and so they've got lots of, lots of spectra in there. This is primarily a commercial database, so if you buy an Agilent GCMS, um, you typically will be able to get that bundled with your package. So does anyone have any questions about GCMS and, and how the process is done? I didn't want to go into a lot of detail because uh, in some respects it's similar to what you guys just did in your exercise um, with, with the NMR. Obviously, the software interface is, is different, but conceptually, there's a lot of similarity. Yes? No, it's actually, what it's looking at is the full fragmented spectrum, so you'll see that actually the, the major peak um, and then the fragmented peak. So in that case, the valine, there's a molecular weight was 144. I guess I'm not sure if that's silated or something, or maybe not. That's, I think, just the paradigm. And then there's a fragment that comes out at 73 Daltons. Um, so it, it picked that out as, as, as being, those are two peaks, those are the part of the spectra. Uh, then it matched it. But there's a couple other tiny little fragments uh, also that weren't so, as in, so intense. And then it just matched that to the, the reference valine spectrum that's already in, in the NIST database. So there's a lot of stuff in the background that's going on in the AMDIS software. 
um, that I don't think anyone really knows uh, <laughs> that it, how it does it. Um, there's been a paper describing it, so everyone knows about how its, it's, it's dot product function works, and a lot of people use that same concept even for LCMS and other things. But how it actually pulls out the peaks and which ones are going to be part of that, it's a kind of a mysterious process for, for their software. And this is a great file. Do you run on that after this, like actually being mature, for example, compound material? What they strongly recommend is this alkane mixture because that calibrates. It's, it's a standard thing. And, and Standardization is really critical for consistency in any field, whether it's genomics, proteomics, or metabolomics. So GCMS has, has been framed in standardization for several decades, and, um, and this is good because GCMS, even in the 1970s, was used standardly in clinical chemistry and analytical chemistry. And it was critical to get that stuff standard so that every lab doing clinical chemistry would get the same results uh, on the same samples. And so they they pushed very hard in the community, in the analytical and clinical chemistry community. And so metabolomics people who are sort of newcomers shouldn't try and you know change a good thing. Uh, we should really stick with that those standards and, and follow them as closely as we possibly can because all of the databases, all of the retention indices were structured on that on those standards. Um, ideally, yes, if you're going to try and quantify those things, you want to have those, those actual standards. So what you'll do is you'll run the standards, you'll run calibration curves for that to get your quantitation um, under the same or identical uh, conditions. So you'll, you'll run your quantitation standards maybe shortly after you've run your um, retention time calibration standards. Um, but typically, after you've run your quantitation standards, you could use the same standards for several months. You don't have to, that is, you don't have to rerun them every single day. The values should be consistent if, if the instrument's being well maintained. <laughs> What's that? If the column works. If the column is stable and, 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 and things. And eventually, after a few months, you might have to do uh, another rerun for your quantitation. Other questions? Okay, so we're going to do LCMS. And um, in this case, if you notice, the, um, the picture looks almost identical. In fact, it is identical to the GCMS. And guess what? It, it really is fundamentally identical. Um, obviously, the databases may be different. Um, in many cases, it's not just two or three peaks. It could be half dozen uh, metabolites or more under a single peak, or dozens under a single peak. But conceptually, it's still the same thing. You have a chromatogram. It's not a GC chromatogram, but it's an LC chromatogram. Under each peak, you have multiple other compounds, and you do matching of, of spectra. Now, in the case of metabolite identification, this is something that the Metabolomic Society and the Metabolomic Standard Initiative has been advocating, but there are different levels to identification. Uh, the lowest level are the unknown compounds. So these are just peaks. You say, I don't know what it is. It has a retention time and it has this kind of spectrum, but I don't know what it is. You can go up another level where you might say, this compound I know because I've derivatized it with uh, this or I've, based on its molecular weight, it's you know, so large and so hydrophobic it has to be some kind of lipid. So you can identify things by their compound class, lipid, sugar, amino acid, something like that. A third level is, is identi putatively identified compounds, and this third level is where most of us are at. It's a case where we've matched to the mass spectrum and maybe the retention index or retention time, or we've matched the mass tandem mass spectra to something in a database, or the EI MS to a date something in a database. So most of the matches you get even in, in GCMS to AMDIS and NIS are still sort of at this putatively identified. Um, in the case of the highest level, positively identified compounds, um, this is when you can match it to a known standard. 
So you've actually run the standard, you've spiked in the standard. And this is a case for MS. NMR is a little different because often in NMR you have not only peak positions, but you also have the peak intensity and the peak patterns. So there's enough information in the NMR spectrum in most cases to actually have them uh, qualified at, at the level four identification. But mass spec, because it's often sometimes just a single mass, um, and because you, the reproducibility of intensities is highly variable, the reproducibility of patterns is highly variable, uh, and even the reproducibility of retention times is highly variable, that's where most mass spec falls, is sort of this level three. So in the case of LCMS, unlike GCMS, um, it's really good for lipids, uh, fatty acids, generally hydrophobic molecules. You can pick up amino acids, you can pick up organic acids. Um, um, but because most people run uh, these reverse phase columns, it has a bias often towards more nonpolar molecules than GCMS or NMR. Ideally, what you'd like to do to be confident of your spectral identifications is you want both a mass match but also a tandem MSMS -MS match. Many people just simply stop at the paradigm mass match and say, I'm done. And that level, I would say, is often closer to somewhere between here and here. It's not very reliable. And often when people go back and when they use more powerful targeted methods to see, you know, were these things really there? More often than not, they weren't. And, and this is, I think, uh, we'll get metabolomics into a lot of trouble uh, if we have a very light, uh, lightweight identification. So simply matching by mass is, is not the way to do metabolomics. Um, ideally, you also want to have standards if you can. Uh, and there are, you don't have to have exact compounds. Uh, you can actually match by classes of compounds using uh, single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring. That's a technique that's well used, well understood, works very, very well. Um, so the compound ID that most people still use, as I say, and I frown upon it, and I think more and more people are frowning on it, is the fact that if you can get pure mass, single mass matches, um, more and more they demand you know, evidence by tandem MS matching and by authentic standards. So at the simplest level, if you just have a molecular weight, a mass, parent ion mass, let's say, you can go to a variety of databases. Uh, I think most of you have heard of these. Certainly everyone's probably heard of PubChem. It's Kebby, there's ChemSpider, there's also HMDB. Each of these databases has different roles and it's important to understand these. So the largest database is PubChem, close second is ChemSpider, 35 million, 28 million compounds, lots. Remember what I told you, 99.99% of these compounds in here have never left the laboratory. Therefore, they cannot be in any metabolome, ever. So, unless you know um, which compounds are metabolites and which ones aren't, uh, you're going to have lots of false leads. And this is really unfortunate where people feel that the larger the database, the better off I am. Well, the result is there's a lot of garbage that's being published because they're getting essentially spurious hits to these things. Another level is KEBI, and these are chemicals of biological interest. This database only has about 35,000 compounds, but these are biological compounds. KEBI covers plants, animals, microbes, and mammals, so it's pretty diverse. It includes drugs, includes toxins and poisons. So it, it isn't organism specific. So if you get a hit on, you know, say, trehalose, which is a plant sugar, it shouldn't be in, a, say, a bacterium. Um, if you get uh, a hit on, on sphingomyelin, that shouldn't be in yeast, because they don't have nerves. However, that doesn't distinguish this. And so ideally what you want to have is some association where metabolite to an organism so HMDB is an example of an organism-specific metabolome database. So there's about 40,000 compounds, all of which have been confirmed to be in humans. 
Now, it doesn't cover every compound that has ever been in the humans, but right now it's our best estimate. So yeah, there are a few compounds in PubChem that are in humans that are not in HMDB, but it's getting to be fewer and fewer. On the other hand, there's actually several thousand, uh, perhaps close to 10,000 compounds that are in HMDB that are not in PubChem. So you can do molecular weight searches uh, through PubChem. Uh, under advanced search, you can type in a molecular weight range and it'll give you a list of compounds. So if we typed in a range, in this case, we've got 473 hits with this molecular weight range from 891.1 to 891. Can't read it. 0.5. So here's a whole bunch of hits, lots of compounds. These have matching molecular weights. Um, so that's a simple mass search. Kebby, you can do the same thing. You can draw a structure, but you also can do mass searches. And you can search through, through that and get hits. So lots of resources have mass matching, but that's really, really weak. Um, it's not what you should ideally do. You, tend, you would ideally want to do more advanced searches where you're listing not only perhaps a single mass, but maybe the tandem mass spectra uh, or the EIMS spectra. And so in that regard, there's the NIST database that we've talked about and some of the other ones. There's the Metlin database, which is widely used by people in the mass spec community. HMDB and MassBank are other examples that also have um, archival MS data or MSMS data. So you can put in at least these databases allow you to search by molecular weight, which is not so good. Molecular weight ranges, not so good. But you can do these parent ion searches where you're looking at neutral or positive and negative ion. You can have tandem MS data, submit that, see what matches based on that dot product that they use. Um, so these are more powerful. Um, unfortunately, they don't have large collections of MSMS -MS data. Um, so this is uh, an MS compound search for HMDB. Uh, you can type in a list of metabolites or not of, of masses, and this may include uh, adducts and, and uh, doubly charged species, so just a list of masses that you have. It could be tens to hundreds to thousands, and it will produce a list of possible or probable hits along with their adducts and adduct masses and a measure of the quality of the hit. So say 40,000 compounds from humans, so if you know you're working on a human or mammalian system, uh, that's probably pretty good, uh, but the effect is because of all the adducts, uh, there's maybe 400,000, half a million predicted masses in the database. There's about 30 uh, different adduct systems that it generates. It also integrates some of the, the data from other databases like FoodDB and ToothDB and DrugBank. So it is potentially useful. I, I, it's not something I would uh, use a lot myself uh, for doing mixture deconvolution um, when you've got multiple compounds. It does as well have about a thousand experimental tandem MS spectra done at three different collision energies collected on a triple quad. Uh, we've compared these to ion trap instruments and they're about the same in terms of the fragment patterns and intensity, so they seem to be generally valid. Um, so you can also compare your tandem mass spectra to this collection to see what matches. And so in this case, if you've identified a clear spectrum, you want to see or confirm if your spectrum matches that, uh, you can do that sort of search as well. Metlin has a very similar kind of um, protocols or methods that HMDB does. Uh, you can put in masses, you can select whether you're positive, neutral, or negative ion, whether you want to have different types of adducts, and then you can search for different metabolites and it produces lists. Um, Metlin is nominally uh, mammalian, but it covers lots of things plants, microbes, other things. So it's, it's really more a mass spec database of metabolites. You can also do tandem MS spectra, and, and rather than typing in a list of peaks, you can actually upload a, an MZ, ML, MZ, XML, MZ data type format, and it will read it, and it will do the search. So it can save you a bit of time in terms of um, having to type in peaks or select those peaks. So identification of metabolites by LC, ESIMS, um, the, the very nature of it means that you typically produce uh, 
lots of salt adducts. Um, you also have what are called neutral losses. They'll have multiply charged species in some cases. So these generate lots of extra peaks. And I think I had written down 50%. It's actually, these days, it's typically about 80% of the peaks that you see in an LC ESIMS spectrum are these peaks. So you can call it noise, because it's, it's not, say, the parent ion that you're really looking for. <laughs> so your challenge is to distinguish those addicts, those multiply charged species, uh, and to group them together so that you can identify or isolate what is the parent ion, which is the one that has most of the information. So here's a, an ESI spectrum, and here's the parent ion, and then here are some of the isotopomers. And here's this ion, which is a sodium adduct. So it's you know, 20, 22 Daltons more, essentially. Um, and then there's the isotopomer. So this one is more intense. And it's the one you might want to use, but in fact, this is not the compound. It's a sodium ion. This is the parent ion. And, and so um, sodium adducts are very abundant. And depending on the number of charges, could have something that might have two sodium adducts, a single sodium adduct. Um, so it depends on the chemical nature of the molecule, depends on your solvent, depends on how you've prepared your biofluid uh, or what your biofluid typically is in. So these adducts, which we've mentioned before, some of them are, are um, listed here, sodium, uh, doubly charged, um, things where there may be losses of water or formate. Um, potassium, doubly charged protons, all of these things can create extra peaks. So these aren't derivatives like we were talking about in GCMS, but they are extra peaks that can cause confusion and compound identification. So Oliver Fien has created a very large adduct table. Um, it's posted on his website. Um, but this probably only represents uh, a fraction of known adducts. Uh, more recently, last week, I saw a much larger and longer adduct table with many, many more uh, adducts that, that can and have been seen in systems. Some of them depend on your solvent um, that you're using, uh, but others just naturally and spontaneously form because you're dealing with a biological matrix. There's a nice database called MZDB. Has anyone heard of this? So it's maintained um, at Aberystwyth in, in Wales. Um, and um, it does some nice adduct calculations. Um, you can select certain types of adducts based on what your solution conditions are. But it also does a lot more because it has a lot of plant metabolites. Um, and that makes it somewhat unique. Uh, in the metabolomics world. So you can type in essentially a compound formula. In this case, it was glucose, but it lists all possible adducts and masses for that particular compound. And so if you were expecting to see glucose in, in your spectrum, maybe you will, maybe you won't, um, these are all possible peaks that could be generated in addition to all of the isotopomers. Another thing that happens in mass spec, especially in ESI mass spec, is you'll end up with uh, these neutral losses. So this is a fragmentation that happens. It, it spontaneously happens during ionization, um, possible collisions with, with uh, gases in, in the system. Um, you can also get neutral losses occurring as well in, in, in electron ionization mass spec as well. But, these things are, are, are common, um, and they are, are sort of fragmentation patterns. And they, these ones are useful also for tandem mass spectrometry in, in identifying compounds. Um, so a number of databases allow you to predict adducts. A number of these databases are able to handle or predict ion pairs and multiple charged species. Um, some of them can handle the neutral loss species. Um, and if you only search, as I said, by just mass ranges, you get lots of false positives. So the more you can refine both the peak list 
uh, and the more spectra you can use, or spectral information you can use, the better, the more reliable your hits are. So these are slides that are not in your notes. And these were added last night or the day before about how we can help resolve the complications. So if you want to take some notes, I'll let you pull out your pens. So the process of, of, of handling LCMS spectra, and there is software available, it's usually sold by the vendor, or there are packages that also you can download for free. Um, the idea is, you know, you can, well, you need to eliminate these extra peaks. So you can either remove them or you can consolidate them. So consolidation means these 21 peaks all belong to an adduct of glucose. So I will merge them into glucose. Or you can just simply say, these 21 peaks are adducts of glucose. I will delete them because I only want the parent ion. Same thing with the multiple charged species. These are all multiple charged versions of this compound. I will merge them into a single compound peak or I will delete them. Um, the fragments, things that are arising from neutral losses or spontaneous breakdown just through the sample prep, you also want to try and identify and remove those. Many, many peaks with the more sensitive instruments have these isotopomer peaks, those little peaks that trail off at the higher masses. You can either remove them or consolidate them into the parent modern isotopic mass peak. Um, and then there's noise peaks. Noise coming from the column, noise coming from the instrument. Um, and the way that people are typically removing noise these days in LCMS is that they will either do technical replicates, where they have to have two out of three or three out of four um, samples showing the same peak. If they don't, then that peak is considered noise. Or a better one is to use a dilution series. And you can do dilution with a technical replicate. And if you see two out of three or three out of four still showing up, and you also see that it's diluting at the same level you were diluting the sample, then that also confirms that it's a real peak. So there's a lot of cleanup you have to do with LCMS spectra, a lot. And just to give you sort of a scale, typically people will say, I've just collected my spectrum on my FTMS, I've got 15,000 features. And the immediate message to many people, even at last week's conference, is I've got 15,000 compounds. No. What you have to do is start removing all of your adduct peaks, the sodium and the formate and everything else. So that knocks it down from 15,000 to 12,000. Remove the multiply charged species, that moves it down from 12,000 to 10,000. Remove all those neutral losses, and fragments that typically appear. So you're down to 10,000 and 8,000. <coughs> Remove the isotope peaks. And so if you've got a sensitive system, that's, that's a lot of peaks typically, at least two, sometimes three peaks per, per large peak. So you're down from 8,000 to 3,000. Remove the noise, which is in the blank or which didn't match your dilution series, or didn't reproduce um, from the three or four technical replicates. So the result is that you may have started with 15,000, but more frequently you're down to about 2,500 features. And even then, those, a lot of those are probably not real compounds. So for a positive ohm, you might end up with about 2,500 real peaks. Um, still call them features, we can't necessarily identify them. And then typically when you run negative mode, uh, there's issues with sensitivity and how the ions fly, and typically you generally get about 50% um, or 60% of what you'll see with a positive one. So people may claim, I've got 15,000 features in positive mode and 12,000 in negative mode, 27,000, how wonderful. In the end, if they've done the cleanup, it'll typically be down to around 4,000. Now there are tools that allow you to do this work, not only that you're sold with vendors, but also some freeware uh, that help with that process. Um, now, it would be nice if we could do this, but as I say, to, to, to teach you guys how to do this and to analyze something with 15,000 features would easily kill the two days, so we're not, we're not going to do it. So once you've got it cleaned up and you've got most of your parent ions identified, then you can start doing some of the fun stuff, and that's the identification. So high mass accuracy, you've seen this before, allows you to identify compounds, particularly with these two, Orbitrap and FTMS. So one thing you can do quite 
routinely is with sufficiently high MS data, you can generate the molecular formula. It doesn't tell you the compound, but it certainly narrows it down. And so that's what we might call that level two classification, the compound class. So you need a uh, accurate mass and then probably some error limit that you can measure from your instrument. Uh, so there are some packages, uh, commercial packages, where you can type in a, an accurate mass, a mass error, and it will return a set of formulas that are viable. But as I say, it doesn't identify the compound, but it identifies a probable class. High chem, uh, some of the stuff I think they're starting to move to freeware, but it's still um, more commercial. Uh, it has its own molecular formula generator. Type in your accurate mass, the mass tolerance, and it'll give you a list of compounds that fit it. But there's freeware. So MZDB, which I'd mentioned before, also allows you to do this, and it uses. Um, all of Rafine's uh, paper called Seven Golden Rules, and you can choose your elemental composition. So in most cases, when we look at metabolites, it's just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, and maybe a little phosphorus. But it's you know, rarely fluorine, it's rarely bromine, or chlorine, or potassium. So you can choose to eliminate a lot of those things, and if you just use those five elements, it, it reduces a lot of the uh, molecular, uh, possible molecular formulas. Um, so if you have your molecular formula, then you can actually go to some of these other databases. So you could go to PubChem and type in your molecular formula, and it uh, starts giving you some hits. But remember, most of the hits are synthetic molecules that have not ever seen outside the lab. Kebi also supports formula searches. Uh, these are biological compounds, so their hits are generally more relevant. Um, HMDB also does uh, formula uh, searches. Now, if you use additional information, uh, particularly the isotopic abundance, so that was sort of the data that we threw out originally, uh, which is not related to the paradigm mass, but if you bring that information back in, that isotopomer abundance, you might recall how we were looking at the different profiles for uh, chlorobenzene, how you saw those six different isotopomers and they had different intensities and positions. That's, that's useful information. So um, you, know, you could find a molecule that has exactly the same molecular weight as chlorobenzene, but you would never find a molecule that would have that same isotopic abundance as chlorobenzene because of the unique features of uh, the abundance of chlorine uh, 37. So there are other things that you can use, not only isotopic abundance, but you can use what are called chemical bonding restrictions that, that limit, you know, you can always come up with a formula for maybe C6H5. Um, period, you know, is that a viable chemical? And using these formulas, no, it isn't. Um, so uh, there's other issues like compositional data, restricting to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and other things, restricts the number of both formulas and, and chemicals that could be generated. So this is embodied in, in Oliver Fiend's paper that appeared a few years back called the Seven Golden Rules. And this is implemented in that MZDB. It's also implemented in Oliver Fiend's website where they have a, uh, a basic um, macro, um, programming macro written in Excel uh, that allows you to do that same sort of thing. Um, so you can download that Excel macro to do it, but it's probably easier to do it through the MZDB uh, website. Anyways, this is just an example of, of the sort of thing. If you just if you had no restriction, just simply used molecular formulas, you could potentially get lots of composition. But as you start restricting things, going from in this case eight million, you get a 12, 13 fold reduction using the uh, seven golden rules. Um, if you look through databases that have you know known chemicals, it's even smaller. And then if you look at uh, natural products, it's it's tiny. So this is you know a great way of restricting it. Um, as you get up in molecular weight, you can obviously have more and more viable compounds. Um, and this is a sort of a feature that climbs, and as you get up to molecular weights of seven or 800, there's potentially many, many formulas that you could generate, um, almost getting to a point where it's ridiculous. There's been calculations, a number of groups have been showing as you reduce your mass or increase your mass accuracy or the precision, you can substantially 
restrict the number of, of possible formulas. And then if you start using isotopic abundance, then it gets it even smaller. So these are mass accuracies that you can even get with TOF instruments. This is the instrument, you know, if you had an FTMS and had, you know, $6 million. But with a half million dollar TOF instrument uh, and using the isotopic abundance and reasonably good mass accuracy, you've nailed it. You've identified um, the, the molecular formula. Um, and this isn't even trying to say just restrict it to pub chem. This is, this is all possible uh, chemical formulas. Um, so this is an example where uh, people actually, I think, have used this to help identify a compound, but they figured out the parent ion mass, they looked at the isotopic abundance uh, with a higher resolution, not really high inst resolution instrument, um, but, you know, here's the high accuracy mass. Um, and it allows you to, in this case, identify the compound uniquely. Um, a challenge in mass spectrometry is identifying isomers. So lots of compounds have identical <coughs> molecular weights and molecular formulas, but are fundamentally different structures. Um, if you only used parent ion mass, you could not distinguish these. Um, but if you are able to um, use retention time, or if you had uh, software that generates mass fragments. So we're seeing these mass fragments. You can see that the mass fragment patterns distinguish those isomers. So parent ion alone will start failing with this, and so this is why you tend to have to use other pieces of information, retention time, retention index, or tandem mass spectrometry, or these isomer generators, which will generate possible structures that allow you to sort of say, is this reasonable? Would I be able to expect these kinds of fragments? Um, is this um, something that, that, that should be there? Um, we don't have a good idea of how many possible chemical isomers are, are available, but it's, it's, it could potentially be very, very large. Um, so this is another challenge. It's unique to mass spectrometry because we can't easily distinguish isomers the way they can with NMR. As I said before, there's this issue where many of the large databases, particularly PubChem, um, NIST, have non-metabolites. Others mix plant metabolites with human metabolites or microbial metabolites with plant metabolites or drugs. Um, and you don't find drugs, at least bacteria as, I far, as far as I know, don't take drugs. So these are things that um, mess, can really seriously mess up. up. If anyone's looked at the EcoPsych database, they might be aware of about half of all the compounds listed in that database are not in E. coli. Um, and uh, this, as I say, can lead to many what I call silly hits. And there's a lot of that that's still published, where people have just simply used a mass match, went out to PubChem, got the first hit, said, this is what I got. Um, so if you know something about the source organism, use that information. If you know it's a plant, if you know it's a microbe, if you know it's human, use the specific databases. And there are, and I'll tell you about them later. Um, there are also databases that are very specific to drug or food um, or to plants like MZDB and NAPSA. There are other approaches that people are starting to use. Uh, and one approach that's becoming increasingly popular in um, mass spectrometry is called chemoselective labeling. It's been used for a long time in proteomics. Is there anyone here that uses selective labeling at all in their metabolomic studies? Just, just fine. Would that include just feeding in heavy isomers and things? Or um, you, you can. That, that certainly that can be used. Um, that's an approach. Um, yeah. Um, so that helps uh, when things are isotopically labeled and you know what's been labeled. And you're using carbon or nitrogen or deuterium. There are also these kits, which I've mentioned before. Biocrates is one group that produces uh, kits for quantitation. And then there are also uh, techniques called computer-aided structural elucidation or case methods. 
So this is an example of using chemo-selective labeling, where it's a case where you will use carbon-13 labeled dancel chloride. And this is heavy dancel chloride. This is light dancel chloride. And the dancel chloride will react with um, a variety of, of, of groups on, on compounds, primarily amines and hydroxyl groups. And so you've now stuck a carbon label onto the substance. You've also stuck a big dancel group onto your metabolite. Um, and that has a couple of benefits. But by doing this heavy and light labeling, where you label it with carbon and 13, carbon 12, you can actually look for paired peaks, uh, one that has one um, mass unit greater that has identical elution times. Um, and with that, you can do a few, so this is the dancel chloride. And this is an example, I think, of uh, uh, dancel chloride with its uh, label um, uh, carbon-12, carbon-13. Uh, and this is a technique that was developed by Liang Li uh, at the University of Alberta, but there are several other groups in the US and in Europe that are also doing it in a similar way, different, different labeling agents. But it allows you to do this externally, so you don't have to feed things. And so in the case of humans, you can't feed them C13 uh, material. So this is a way of labeling things post hoc. But it allows you to quantify. And that's something that, that is rarely done in mass spectrometry. Uh, and the ways that you're able to do this uh, because you've done the carbon labeling. And it's another example, as I say, of, of the importance of quantitation. Um, and here's some examples as well where quantitation was done for urine, uh, measuring down to, to 30 nanomolar with mass spectrometry, and as high as 2.5 millimolar. Um, so they spiked in a bunch of standards. They were able to identify about 100 compounds and, and quantify them. This is actually still the world record in mass spectrometry for compound identification and identification and quantification. Now, the world record for mass spectrometry for identification is something on the order of 350 compounds. But none of them were quantified. So when you derivatize um, compounds uh, with this dancel chloride method, you actually convert uh, non-UV active compounds with the dancel chloride into UV and fluorescently detectable compounds. So you can actually quantify them independently of the mass spec. One thing as well, when you derivatize with these tags, and it doesn't have to be down to chloride people, as I say, around uh, North America and Europe are using these things, uh, it improves the ionization efficiency and you get better detection limits. Likewise, the purification is much simpler. Uh, the molecules are generally much more hydrophobic, so you get much better separations. Um, you get quantification, as I say, which is important. And because of all the other bonuses, you actually increase the number of compounds that you routinely detect. Um, it also allows you to identify real peaks. So you don't have to spend so much time denoising your spectra. And potentially, it could lead to automation by LCMS. Another approach is the Biocrates kit. Um, and this is a commercial kit. Works on a specific instrument, uh, Q-Trap. AB SIEX instrument, QCHOP 4000, QCHOP 5500. It can identify about 160 compounds under ideal circumstances uh, in blood or urine. There's a modified version which can detect up to 180. Arguably, this still holds the record for quantitation identification, um, but uh, the lipids that it identifies are not pure compounds, they're class compounds. So. Um, it still falls short of what um, Dr. Lee's group completed. What the Biocrates kit does is it makes use of something that's been used for many, many years called multiple reaction monitoring or single reaction monitoring. But it, these are uh, ways of, of essentially um, uh, fragmenting a single ion and, and then quantifying it based on the fragments that come from uh, that, that molecule. And by quantifying the intensity of the peaks from those fragments, um, you can, and then comparing it to an isotopic standard, uh, you can precisely quantify uh, how much is there. So this is an old technique. 
but you can largely automate it uh, with modern uh, mass spec software. And so if you uh, run the Biocrates kits, uh, this is an example of the readouts. And you're getting compounds. Here are some amino acids. Here are some carnitines. Here are some uh, phosphatidylcholine groups. They aren't uniquely identified. And then there's sphingomyelins. Uh, and you get concentrations. And you range from um, you know, 10 nanomolar to 7 millimolar. So again, an example of quantitation by mass spec. So you can also, well, we've focused on mass spec, but there's also issues of what if you're trying to identify an unknown unknown. So things that um, don't match our, our libraries, that aren't in the databases, that aren't in the um, uh, mass spectral libraries, how do you do that? And so this is what computer-aided structure elucidation is about. It's matching with new, new novel or uncom unknown compounds. Um, there's a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. And to do um, either of these, typically you have to combine both NMR with mass spec. You can't do it from mass spec alone. Uh, you can get a long ways with mass spec, but it's, it's not quite possible. So what are these top-down and bottom-up approaches? So the top-down is to take, say, your known metabolites, 20,000 endogenous, 40,000 human, 100,000 plant metabolites, whatever, and then predict what kind of chemistry they might undergo. So one way of predicting the kind of chemistry they might undergo is to do uh, biotransformation prediction. So there's software that actually calculates what will happen. Uh, they'll go run molecules through your liver in a virtual way. Um, and they'll predict the phase one and phase two metabolites. They'll predict a variety of other transformations that microbes will do on metabolites. And so from your starting set of 20,000 compounds, you might climb to about 200 or 300,000 compounds. From those predicted compounds, so they, they, aren't, they don't exist in PubMed or PubCam, they don't exist, these are predicted compounds. You can then predict the spectra you can predict the NMR, the MSMS, the GCMS spectra. And once you've got this collection of predicted spectra, then you can compare your observed spectrum and say, does this match? And if there's a good match, then it's a, it's a hypothesis that you need to validate, but at least it gives you something to work from. And so if you validate and say, yes, it is, then that's the case where you've identified a novel compound. And several groups have actually succeeded in doing this recently, particularly with food compounds, polyphenols. There's another database that was developed by Liang Li uh, in our group. Um, it's called My Compound ID, and it does sort of this virtual um, um, uh, production of, of um, uh, phase one and phase two metabolites. And, um, these are transform molecules, and so now you can search against these, these types of compounds. Many endogenous compounds in our bodies also go through that phase one and phase two transformation. Um, this is just an example of the, the website, and some of the adducts that it generates are actually the transformations that it generates. So it does both adduct as well as um, glucuronides and um, other variations. There's a bottom-up method for computer-aided structure elucidation, and this idea is to actually assemble structures, sort of spontaneously, knowing you know, the general features of most metabolites and the general working groups, like indoles and imidazoles and cholesterol rings and things like that. And um, from there, you can start assembling, making you know, virtual compounds. It's synthetic chemistry on the computer. Um, and so you can generate a whole list of viable metabolites that you know, seem to maybe follow some general rule about metabolism. And then from there, do exactly the same thing. Predict your NMR, predict your GC and LCMS spectra and the tandem MS spectra from this virtual set of compounds and then see if it matches. So that's the bottom up. You're trying to assemble chemistry, whereas the other one, which is the top down, is take the known chemistry and then metabolize it virtually using... Uh, a synthetic liver or kidney. Uh, 
So these are approaches to try and deal with unknown compounds uh, in a computational way. Of course, the other approach is just to do good old chemistry, analytical chemistry, where you look at the NMR and think about it, and do some mass spec and think about it, and draw out some structures and think about it. And generally, the amount of time it takes to truly identify a novel compound is about three to four years per compound. So that's it for uh, our session.